Thank you everyone for joining us in Boston and online by webcast for the Knowledge in Motion Lecture and Webcast Series. I'm Leslie Morse, I'm the Program Director for the Spalding Harvard SCI Model System Center and I'd like to thank you again for joining us this evening. We are webcasting this evening's lecture to more than 30 states nationwide and internationally in countries such as the United Kingdom, Ethiopia, India, Morocco, Portugal, Saudi Arabia, Japan, and Canada. This evening it really gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker, Dr. Marka Sipsky alexander She is the Associate Chief of Staff at, um, of Rehabilitation Medicine at Birmingham uh, Medical Center and a Clinical Professor of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at the University of Alabama School of Medicine. Dr. Uh, alexander is a internationally renowned expert in the topic of spinal cord injury and sexuality. She is a consultant on our SCI Model System Center here, and she is very, very active and engaged in developing um, telemedicine specifically for addressing the medical needs of people with spinal cord injury. And in fact, she's here in town tonight to help get our telemedicine program in spinal, spinal cord injury and sexuality up off the ground and running. And so um, we are very fortunate to, to have her here, and I'd like to extend a warm welcome to her. Um, am I coming through okay, sound-wise? Everything like that? Good. Well, thank you all for coming tonight, and thank all of you around the world for listening to the talk today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, hopefully, some of everybody's favorite topic here, and that's sexuality after spinal cord injury. And I really want people to learn a lot tonight and um, enjoy the presentation, kind of get an overview of some things and feel like you know what some of the options are that you might not have heard about before or be able to kind of open your eyes to some new things that um, you might be able to try. And I just want to let everybody know I do try to be um, a little bit light in my talk, so I might try to be a little funny. I might be funny, I might not, but if I'm, and if I'm not, then you can laugh at me, or if I am, you can laugh with me. But um, I think in, in the area of sex, um, sex in, is an area where it doesn't matter if you have a spinal cord injury or not, or whatever is going on in your life, you have to be able to take it with a grain of salt. You have to realize there's ups, there's downs, and you just want to try to enjoy ourselves as much as we can. So having said that, um, back when I started working in spinal cord injury, which was way back in the early 80s, um, the concept of sex in spinal cord injury was really um, not a positive thing. In fact, I put this picture here because um, some of you may recognize Tom Cruise on the left there, who was a lot younger at the time. But back in the mid-80s, Tom Cruise was listed as, um, by People Magazine, as America's sexiest man. And at the same time, he was also in Born on the Fourth of July, where he was playing someone with a spinal cord injury. And when he, you, so you took the sexiest man in America, you gave him a spinal cord injury, and what happened was he couldn't have an erection. He couldn't have sex. And, not only was it really not an accurate portrayal of what should have happened with somebody with a spinal cord injury, but it was like, it was a total turnoff. It was like saying, spinal cord injury isn't sexy. And the good thing now is, I think things have changed. Um, we see here some women from Push Girls, and I don't think there's anybody in the room that's gonna say that these women aren't sexy. They're in wheelchairs, but they're definitely um, able to show their sexuality. And that's definitely also the case in men with spinal cord injury. This is a image from a website called Streetsy, where, um, and the, the um, photographer is Rasso Brucker, but he has some of the most amazing pictures of people in chairs. Um, and so certainly being in a wheelchair does not prevent someone from being sexually attractive. So having said that, my goals tonight are going to be threefold. One is going to be help you understand how spinal cord injury affects sexual functioning. 
to make you aware of what is probably even more important than your spinal cord injury is other contributing factors in terms of sexuality and sexual concerns. And then also to empower everyone. We've all got questions at times in our lives, and we've got to feel okay about asking those questions, getting answers about the questions, and getting treatment for our issues. And a lot of times, you know, sex isn't the first thing in your doctor's mind um, when you're seeing your doctor. Um, they're not thinking first about your sex life. So if you have thoughts about something related to sexuality, it's really, we, we have the onus on ourselves to bring those issues up. So, as I've been doing this for a while in terms of talking about sexuality and spinal cord injury, um, things kind of gel together to me in terms of the concept of sexual sustainability. That's really what we're looking for after spinal cord injury is what do we do to sustain our sexuality? And this is, this is not dissimilar for people as we get older too, or go through different phases of life or illnesses. Um, so what are the issues we really need to think about in terms of sexual sustainability? Um, the first thing I'd like to say is communication. Communication is key. Um, whether it's verbal communication, whether it's physical, whether it's mental, um, you've got to communicate to let people know where your head is, what your thoughts are, what your needs are. Then if we're talking about your spinal cord injury, spinal cord injury, unless you have a congenital injury, is generally happening at some point in time in life. And we all have a sexual history. Um, whether you're 15 years old and you've never had any sexual encounters, or if you're 45 years old and you've had three children and you've been married twice, we have a pre-existing sexual history. And if there were issues prior to injury, those issues don't go away because of your spinal cord injury. So we have to think about what the issues are before injury. The next thing that I find very important is that we need to look at what your neurologic examination is. How exactly does spinal cord injury affect your sexual responses? And what would be the maximum function you'd anticipate? What are the things you can do to of impact how your responses occur. Once you kind of know where things are, the next step is practicing. Things do take time and you need a lot of practice sometimes. Sometimes we need counseling. There are issues that come up, medication issues that can impact sexuality. It's important to work with your practitioner and then work on some treatment approaches. So this is kind of the overview of what I want to talk about for the next few minutes. So if we talk about how your spinal cord injury affects your sexual functioning, specifically sexual response. Now basically, there are two different pathways that um, control arousal and control orgasm. And the first pathway is kind of the psychologic pathway, or the psychogenic pathway. And that's um, shown here by the little light bulb by the brain. You think something, you see something, you smell something, you hear something, and the arousal starts in the brain, and the impulse travels down, and we know that it actually, in terms of going to the genital region, the impulse interacts at the thoracolumbar sympathetic fibers. That's where the second level of um, innervation comes through to the genitals. So that's a really important area for psychological arousal. So that's one type of arousal, is just seeing something, hearing something, psychological. The other kind is reflex. And you see that little reflex camera at the bottom there. Well, that reflex arousal occurs in the lowest part of the spinal cord and occurs in those sacral nerve roots. So depending on where the injury is, you may impact one type of arousal or the other type of arousal. <clears throat> if the injury is higher up and you completely cut off that psychological arousal, you'll be aroused in your brain, but it's not going to make it past the level of the injury. So the responses in the body below the level of injury won't be similar to prior. 
So thinking about sex is not going to make you have an erection if you're a man. Thinking about sex is not going to make you get lubricated if you're a woman. But you'll still get excited above the level of injury. You'll still be sexually aroused and turned on. On the other hand, if you've got that reflex intact, just like you get spasms in your legs, you can kind of have genital spasms, is what I, would, I tend to think of them as. And so by being touched in the area, rubbed in the area, you would get an erection or you could get reflex lubrication. So depending on where your injury is, one of those pathways can be affected or the other one can be affected. Now that's just in terms of arousal. The other thing we think of in terms of sex is the issue of orgasm. And the question is, you know, what is an orgasm? Can I have orgasms? Well, orgasms, from what I've seen in my research, are basically a reflex response. And the sensation we experience during orgasm is not something we measure when we test your sensation for spinal cord injury. It's not a surface sensation. It's an internal sensation. So a lot of people with spinal cord injuries will still feel some type of orgasm. And given the opportunity, from my research, people chose genital stimulation for trying to achieve orgasm. Now, because the spinal cord is so complex, because there are so many different areas where injuries can occur, and so many people have incomplete injuries, they have areas that are damaged in terms of the nerve fibers, areas that aren't. What I really wanted to do during my career was study which people would have preservation of sexual function with different types of injuries. And it turns out that depending on where the injury is, you can predict, based on the surface sensation, what functions will occur from a sexual standpoint. Now this is an um, image of the neurologic standards, which I'm pretty sure all the people in this room have probably heard of them at some point in time. But this is the International Standards for Spinal Cord Injury. And if we look at these standards, basically, there's two things we need to know about. Okay, this is a detail of what the doctors would do in your neurologic exam. But if you're thinking about your body, what is really the key to knowing whether or not you can have that kind of arousal genitally from your brain, the psychologic arousal, it really is whether you can feel when somebody touches you or cold or hot sensation or pinprick sensation between the belly button and where the pockets are. So if you think of where your pockets are here and where the belly button is, this area of the body, the more sensation there is in that area of the body, it doesn't matter what your level of injury is, the more sensation there is that you can feel on the surface in that area, the more likelihood there is that you would have either psychogenic erection or psychogenic lubrication. So what I tell people is, if you've got that sensation there, then you really want to emphasize the the lights, the music, the, the sexy communication, all those psychological aspects of arousal. Because that's an area where you do have your function intact. Now the lowest part of the spinal cord, the area around the rectum and the, the butt, the, you know, the bottom of the cheeks and around the butt, that area of sensation is the area where the reflex arousal is controlled. So, if you have reflexes intact there, then you're more likely to have the reflex erections or lubrication. So based on the neurologic exam, we can predict how arousal occurs. We can also see whether or not you're going to have more difficulty or not in terms of having orgasms. Because basically, um, we've been able to look at a lot of different people in a laboratory and show that it's actually a lot more likely for many people than they realized in the past to achieve orgasm after spinal cord injury. So again, just to say, it's the area between the belly button and the pockets is the area that we found predicts the psychologic arousal. And then in terms of the issue of other functions, so say your injury is high up, okay, 
if you have spasms in your legs. If you have spasms in your legs, you're generally going to be able to have that reflex function. You've got spasticity. Um, and then the psychologic function will depend on whether or not you have that sensation between the belly button and the pockets. Now, what about the question of orgasm? Well, in a laboratory, when we had people with spinal cord injuries come in, both men and women, um, pretty much about 50% or more of people could stimulate themselves to orgasm in the laboratory, despite having complete injuries or incomplete injuries. So if half of the people could do it, despite the fact that many people were on medications that would cause anyone not to have an orgasm, there definitely seems like there is the potential for people to have genital orgasms. Now, on the other hand, if the injury is really low down in the spinal cord, um, if your legs are real floppy, if you don't reflexly move your bowels, or if you have, if you have to disimpact yourself, or if you don't reflexly urinate, then this group of people is less likely to have a genital orgasm. They are able, a lot of times, to have orgasms that are non-genitally focused, but for genital, it seems like they're less likely. Now, in terms of the other aspects of sexual function, too, certainly, if they have that pathway intact, the psychologic function seems like it will work, and it's easier for people to have the psychologic function if they have the lower injury. But the reflex function can be more difficult for people. So, depending on where the injury is, we look at what we think will happen. And that's something you can all do on your own, clearly. You don't need someone else to help you with that, potentially. So the question is, how do we know what works? What do you need to do to know what works? Well, you know, we don't know unless we try. And what I would say is that I would really encourage a person with spinal cord injury to try to self-stimulate to see what works, um, to have their partner stimulate them to see what works. Because unless you try and get comfortable with it, going to that next phase is not that easy. So whether it's hands, whether it's another person, whether it's a vibrator, trying is a good um, idea. And you can find certainly all over the internet um, more opportunities for methods for stimulation than probably there are people in this, well I mean, definitely than there are people in this room and probably people listening to this talk. Practicing alone um, is something that can be done, or practicing with a partner. Um, and having said this, I have to say a lot of my images come from the internet, and um, one of the places I look is the Street C website, another is sexsci.me, um, which is an Australian website, and um, I guess I just want to say thank you to all the people that have been so kind as to put their images on the internet. This is um, this picture here comes from Street C, and I think it's um, very meaningful because what this person says is, "I've never been kissed. It's not that I don't want to. It's just nobody else does." So I want to balance things here. I'm talking a lot about what's happening physiologically, but it's sexist. So multifactorial. Sex is physical, but sex is also psychologic. Sex is emotional. It's about closeness. It's about tenderness. And having a partner is that next area we talked about. You know, practicing alone is one thing. Then also practicing with a partner is important. And just having a partner is important. Um, so we need to be sensitive to that and think about all areas of what our concerns are in sexuality, what our issues are. So having said that, I've done a lot of research. And what does research show? And I think the thing that research shows is that the older you get and the more you do research and the more you learn about life in general, the more you realize what you know is less than what you don't know and what you don't even know you don't know might be bigger than both of them combined. So having said that, I want to share with you a little bit of what I've found through researching what the potential is for people with spinal cord injuries. 
And actually, back almost 15 years ago now, I did do a lot of laboratory-based research with funding from National Institute of Health. And I had a laboratory um, where kind of, if anybody watched um, Masters of Sex on TV, Masters and Johnsons, I had a laboratory kind of similar for spinal cord injured persons. And so I studied 62 women with spinal cord injuries and 21 able-bodied women in the laboratory and did different, different protocols. One of the protocols, we looked at the lubrication, which is how I was saying how we knew about the, the pockets and that sort of thing. That comes directly from the research. But we also had people stimulate themselves to orgasm. And what we did was we said, any way you can, just stimulate yourself to orgasm. We gave them a movie, and we did give them a vibrator, um, and let them do what they wanted. And the reality was that even though people had complete spinal cord injuries, um, everybody in the lab chose their genitals to stimulate. And about, well, 44% of the women with spinal cord injuries had orgasms in the lab. Now there was a big difference in terms of how long it took. It took women with spinal cord injuries a longer period of time than it did able-bodied women. But even though we were worried about whether women would get dysreflexic, because that's a big issue that comes up a lot of time is dysreflexia in sex, we didn't have anybody have unsafe blood pressure. We didn't have any issues with that at all during this study. What we did find was that the blood pressure and the pulse of orgasm were similar between able-bodied women and women with spinal cord injuries. Um, and in fact, my colleagues were blinded to the descriptions of orgasm by women that were able-bodied, women with spinal cord injuries with complete injuries, and women with incomplete injuries. And they couldn't tell which ones were from able-bodied women, which one were from women with complete injuries, which ones were from incomplete injuries. So there was only one group of women that had a harder time having orgasms, and we only had six women with complete lower motor neuron injuries. And out of those six women, only one could have an orgasm. So those women did have a little harder time than other women, but in terms of everyone, um, it definitely was possible for the women with spinal cord injuries to have orgasms. It was harder, but still possible. And this is just showing the pattern of injury versus the ability. We also studied men with spinal cord injuries. And we had 45 men with spinal cord injuries and 16 able-bodied men. And again, we looked at whether the men had orgasms at home and whether they had them in the laboratory. The time to orgasm was also longer in the men with spinal cord injuries, though it wasn't as significant with the um, compared to the women. And, but the blood pressure and the pulse and orgasm were also similar between men with spinal cord injuries and able-bodied. In the men, the same thing happened. The men with the complete lower motor neuron injuries had a harder time achieving orgasms, um, and they were um, the least common. Now, men with incomplete injuries did have more orgasms than men with complete injuries. And then finally in men, it was very common that the men reported dry orgasms. Now when we think about orgasm in men, most people think about ejaculation. You know, a man, when they're able-bodied, thinks about orgasm, and he knows he had an orgasm when he comes. He knows, he sees ejaculate, or I had an orgasm. And men are not really in tuned into the fact that you don't always have to have semen come out of your body to have an orgasm. So this was a big change, I think, in terms of men with spinal cord injuries that we have not um, really explored that much. And we don't tell people about it. The point is that maybe people do have more potential, but they're not thinking that have potential because nothing's coming out. So, well, I guess I can't have an orgasm. But it was quite common in our study. So if you have a spinal cord injury and you can't feel anything when people touch you, then why, why am I up here telling everybody you can have an orgasm? Well, there's a couple reasons I just want to bring up here because this is a big topic and this is an area that has not been conclusive, concluded. Orgasm has not been like definitively described in people that are non-spinal cord injured. There's still like, you know, people talk about it one way or another, what's, what's going on, that sort of thing. Basically, I think there's a couple points here I just want to bring up that orgasms are internal. They're not external. 
when people feel having an orgasm, they're not feeling the sensation on the exterior of their body. It's, and it's not what doctors test when you have a spinal cord injury. When we test your sensation with a spinal cord injury, we're testing specifically the surface. We're not testing internally. So it's different. The other thing is that after spinal cord injury, we know reflexes are in place. Well, there's a lot of animal and human research that will show that orgasms are basically a reflex. So just as your reflexes can occur in terms of moving your bladder or your bowels, orgasms can occur. They can occur without ejaculation. The other thing is that there is a phenomenon of non-genital orgasms. And there are many able-bodied people that will report that they can have non-genital orgasms. And certainly after spinal cord injury, a number of people will report the same thing. And if we think about how that could happen, um, my own belief is it's related to the sympathetic nervous system, which um, I may get into talking a little bit about that later, but basically it's an autonomic reflex. So the centers in the body where the sympathetic nervous system come out, um, those areas get more excited and then there's a relaxation response. The other thing I think is interesting is that um, people have done a lot of PET scan studies now and fMRI and that sort of thing, and they've shown that what basically is happening at the time of orgasm is that there's decreased function in the brain. So the frontal part of the brain kind of quiets down. So this is a time for relaxation. And there are ways and pathways that um, this can certainly happen in people with spinal cord injuries. So what do we need to do? Again, we're getting back to the, the sexual sustainability. And that means, what do we, you know, what's the steps again? Well, you're going to educate yourself, explore the options, and speak with a counselor or speak with your doctor about what these concerns are sexually. Bring them up if you have sexual concerns. You may be sitting here now and say, hmm, I didn't know I should be able to have that happen. And what can I do to make it happen? So, now that you know these things, let's start exploring our options. Now just because there is a potential for certain things to happen in our bodies, it doesn't mean our bodies work the way they, quotes, should work. Sex is so multifactorial. I am sure there's not a single person in this room that has not been sexually active at some point in time in their lives and things weren't working the way they anticipated they were, wanted them to work for some reason or another. A uh, prime example is if you're worried about something or if you're a parent and your children are in the room next door or if you're a student and you have a test tomorrow, all these other things impact on sexuality. And a lot of these issues are really iatrogenic issues for people with spinal cord injuries on um, medications. A lot of the medications that we give people do have sexual side effects. And so if you take an area where it's going to be a little bit more difficult to have sex, and then you add those side effects to it, well, you've given yourself that double whammy. Illness. If you're sick, nobody wants to have sex if they feel sick. Um, kids. Family members. The more stress we have in our lives, or even if it's stress about wanting to have children, the more stress, the less pleasure sex becomes. Loneliness, depression, um, having a partner, all those areas impact someone's sexuality. Going back into the pre-existing sexual issues, primary sexual dysfunctions are not uncommon in people. Many people have a history of sexual abuse. Um, many people may have had difficult sexual experiences at a child as a child. Many people may have relationship issues going on prior to spinal cord injury. Issues related to sexual orientation. And also other illnesses contribute to sexual dysfunction. Hypertension, well these are very common illnesses, especially in the United States. Um, hypertension, depression, diabetes, epilepsy, and drug and alcohol addiction. All those areas impact very intensely on sexual function. So if those issues are there prior to a spinal cord problem, we have to think about those issues and deal with those issues too. 
In terms of medications and sexual dysfunction, I like to think about improving people's sexual function in a very basic way. So to me, the first thing I look at when people have um, sexual concerns and they come to me is not what medications I can give them, but what medications they might be able to get rid of. And I've had men come to me with sexual dysfunction, namely erectile dysfunction. Now to me, the number one issue in terms of erectile dysfunction after spinal cord injury slowly, uh, solely related to injury is the issue of antispasticity medications. The more baclofen you take, the less firm your erection. That's just a reality of life. So adjusting medication sometimes can improve your sexual responses. I've had people where I've said, okay, you know, you want to have sex, let's plan things differently, let's take your medication differently. <coughs> and by just taking their medication differently, I was able to help them in terms of improving their responses instead of just adding Viagra or doing this or that. So the goal is not to add more, the goal is to be prudent about what we use. So antispasticity medications, antidepressants. Many, many people in our country take antidepressants, not just spinal cord injury people. Um, antidepressants are kind of anti-sex drugs. The, they really decrease people's interest in sex and they cause, it, cause people to have more difficulty achieving orgasm. In fact, antidepressants are prescribed for men with premature ejaculation. So antidepressants decrease um, arousal, narcotics. Um, certainly, you've probably heard in the week, the, this week the news about narcotics in the United States. We use most of the narcotics in the world in our country. Narcotics, if you take narcotics for a couple of months, what happens? Your testosterone goes down and interest in sex goes down dramatically. So all of these medications really can impact sexual function. Other medications include antihypertensive medications, some of the bladder medications, and anti-seizure medications. Now some people may be on like gabapentin for pain. Gabapentin can also have sexual side effects. Now when, we come, when you come into acute rehab, you know the first thing that your doctor has to do, and, and I've worked in acute rehab a lot during my life, is, um, and I'm guilty of this certainly, when you come into acute rehab, you've got to learn how to deal with your spinal cord injury. And a lot of times that involves taking different medications. Um, and you know, a lot of times people have to be on these medications for a while, and then gradually, as life goes on, you can cut them down and, and you know, get to a lesser amount of medications which are more practical for real life. So um, that may be something you need to initiate. Maybe something you know, people out there may want to think of themselves. You may be 10 years post-injury and, and say, wow, you know, maybe this is the next phase of life. I want to start thinking about what I can do to improve other aspects of my life and maybe some of these medications could be decreased. But this may need to be something that you as the consumer initiate because it's not something the provider is gonna be thinking of, just first thing. So let's, let's now move over to treating dysfunctions. And let's talk about treating the basics because that's what I think goes first, the basics, not the exotic, the basics. And so we know that men with spinal cord injuries, and also I just wanna say here that a lot of the images I'm showing, these are just basic images off the internet. I'm not advocating for one treatment or another treatment. I'm really trying to give you kind of an overview of what's out there and that sort of thing. So penile rings have been around for a long time. And people have used them not with spinal cord injuries. Um, but with spinal cord injury, as people have, are able to have erections, they might have problems sustaining them. And penile rings can be very useful for maintenance of an erection. Now, having said this, <coughs> there are always risks in terms of problems if some, some treatments are used improperly. Now, if a penile ring is left on too long and the person that had it on too tight, they could have a problem and a lack of blood flow to the penis. So this can happen with a lot of these different treatments for male erectile function. Um, so we don't want that to happen. If you do use a device like this, you need to limit the use of this type of device to about 30 minutes, because after 30 minutes right. can cause problems. There's vacuum suction devices, and there's a lot of different types of vacuum suction devices out there. And basically with vacuum suction devices, you're using a vacuum 
to increase the blood flow to the penis, and then you're applying a ring at the base of the penis. Now with using a vacuum suction device, what actually happens is the penis gets bigger than it would normally get because you're not just creating a vacuum in the internal part of the penis where the spongy part is, you're also creating um, the vacuum in the surrounding tissue. So the penis actually doesn't, it's a little bigger than it would be on a regular basis. Um, and it's not, it's not, uh, it may not be the most cosmetic erection in terms of the group of the erections I'm talking here. But vacuum suction is an option. And again, then you need to use a ring. Now with this type of therapy again, though, we've got that issue of the 30 minutes. So it couldn't be used for more than 30 minutes. There's also injection erections. And you, you can see nicely here in this picture, the two, the, the penis is cut in cross section on the left, um, on the picture on the left side there, and where the uh, needle is placed in. There's actually two, two areas, two cylinders in the penis where the blood flow increases when there's an erection. And so the injection is given in those areas and the blood flow increases only in those areas. And these injection erections work very nicely for people with spinal cord injuries. But again, you're injecting yourself, so it's a little invasive. Again, it shouldn't be on too long because if this injection doesn't go down, that can be a problem. And um, you can get something that many people probably already know this word now from TV, priapism, where the erection occurs and it doesn't go away. And if that erection lasts from this type of technique, or if you're using something like Viagra, and it lasts for a few hours, you need to go to the emergency room um, and get the penis um, irrigated because it could cause a loss of blood flow, and that's not a good thing to have happen. There's also um, a urethral insert where um, prostaglandin, a type of medication, is inserted into the penis. Now this is a treatment that does not work as well as the others. It's something that's out there, so I've shown you what's available, but it doesn't work as well as the other um, treatments. And then there's what have pretty much turned into the most popular standard for people, and that's the PDE5 inhibitors, which is phosphodiesterase type 5 inhibitors. And the story of this is actually that Viagra, which is the first drug that came out there, or sildenafil, it was actually studied for blood pressure. And they were using it for people with, for as a high blood pressure medicine, and it turned out it was giving people erections. So the people at Pfizer said, ooh, this makes a lot more sense. We can make a lot of money off this. So it turned into the first um, oral treatment for um, erections, erectile dysfunction. And, you know, there's a lot of hype about this, and there's also other medications out there now. There's Viagra, there's Cialis, and there's Levitrin. And it goes from now the little blue pill to the weekend. This is just kind of an overview of how these medications work in terms of Viagra or Sildenafil. It's taken an hour before sexual activity. It's absolutely contraindicated to take it with nitrates. Um, it's got side effects of dizziness, headache, some visual changes, and that's because the blood pressure can go down, or it does go down a little bit when you take this medicine. So you don't want to take the medicine with other drugs that would also cause the blood pressure to go down. And interestingly, there's another disorder, pulmonary hypertension, which is another reason now people take Viagra. Vardenafil, or Levitra, is another drug that's similar. It also lowers the blood pressure. You can't take it with those nitrates. And it's got the similar side effects. Um, again, you've got to think about that issue of having an erection that lasts too long. And then there's the weekender, which is Cialis, which is touted as um, working in 15 minutes but lasts 36 hours. And putting this together, I could not figure this picture or this commercial with the people in the bathtubs, but uh, I guess it's, um, it was very popular for some reason. I don't know why. Could you imagine being in a bathtub on top of a mountain? <laughs> okay. All right, what about women? Women in the room are probably like, well, she's doing this talking about men. What about women? Well, if we get back to the basics, which is what we're doing here in women, um, kind of starting in, in the beginning here, uh, the first thing to think about is lubricant. 
and um, lubricant is pleasurable for all. It's out there. There's a billion types of lubricant that are available on the internet, and mostly water-based um, lubricant is what is recommended. And there's all different types, and certainly if it's good for people without spinal cord injuries, it's definitely going to be good for people with spinal cord injuries. So I would highly recommend considering it. The other thing that's very popular is vibrators. There are a million types of vibrators available for women, and, or men too, but vibrators are also popular. So these are two basic ways of improving sexual arousal for women. Now, that's, those are treatments, but we need to also go back to the basics. And that's why I promised here was talking about the basics. Going back to those basics, so if you just pull out a vibrator when you're with your partner, you kind of need to like communicate. It's not something that you can just say, oh, hi, honey, um, you know what, you're not doing it for me, so I'm bringing the vibrator in. I, I don't know how many, I, I, you know, I wouldn't know how to bring that up that easily. I think it's the kind of thing where you've got to have good communication. It's a process. And, and there's probably people in the room here thinking, you know what, maybe we should do that. I've been around for a while, you know. You've got to think about communication. You've got to get to know your partner. You've got, you know, certainly if you don't have a partner, then you've got no problem. But you've got to really get to that level of closeness and intimacy with your partner to be able to communicate about these issues and to know that it's okay. And you know what, maybe it's okay because this is what we're telling you to do in rehab now, it's part of life. For whatever reason, it's okay. It is okay. So we improve communication, that's important. And we need to talk about what are some of the problems that we have? What are some of the issues that come up? Everybody has problems with sex, not just people with spinal cord injuries. Timing of sex is something that gets more and more difficult as life goes on. You know, you're tired. You have to do a bowel program on certain days of the week. You've got to do your bladder care on other days of the week. So sex needs to be something special. You have children to take care of, or parents to take care of, or work to do, or, or it's snowing outside and you've got to go somewhere. So you've got to think about these issues of timing, issues of fatigue, also spasticity. Um, if you've got a lot of problems with spasticity, think about the issues of positioning. Your partner might want to know about what's going to work better for you or not, and that may be something that you've got a problem solve on. The other thing is bladder and bowel issues. Nobody wants surprises, so we want to plan as much as we can in terms of basic treatments. So having um, said this, another issue with spinal cord injury is this issue of bladder and bowel. And I show this picture because if you look over on the the side here with the nervous system. You see on the side here this chain, the sympathetic chain. The sympathetic chain is the part of your body that gets increased activation when you're getting more sexually aroused. Okay? Do you see here all these connecting dots here? The sympathetic chain is connecting to rectum, bladder, and genitalia. It's also connecting to parasympathetic. So there's all these connections in our nervous system, and basically there's overflow of the neurologic response. So we have to be cognizant of that. We need to think about that. We need to know that with sexual function, there can be other issues going on, bladder issues, bowel issues, and they all interact with each other. Not something that should inhibit us, something to be aware of. Okay, getting back into basic treatments. It's been very sterile, and I guess that's not a good thing. Sex is supposed to be sexy, it's supposed to be nice, it's supposed to be pleasurable. We should be sitting in a living room here with couches, and um, we could, you know, express what the real um, situation should be. So what are some of the other basic treatments in terms of improving sexual function? Well, I talked about medications and how so many medications have side effects. Um, also in terms of side effects, you know, alcohol is great. Like 
Do you think that was really over? I think it's great when you have one drink yeah, and a glass of wine. But when you start having two or three, what does it do to your body? Basically numbs it up. So if you have a spinal cord injury and then you have an alcohol on top of it, um, we're numbing up our nervous system. And our nervous system has to be intact for those sexual responses to go, to go through. So refraining from too much alcohol, other drugs is an important thing. The other thing is wellness. Um, instead of taking medications, a lot of times exercises help, and also something called mindfulness. I'm sure people may have heard of mindfulness now or meditation. Actually, as I, I was thinking about it, it's very similar in thoughts to um, what used to be called sensate focus in terms of sexual function. Um, so it, it, the pendulum kind of goes up and back and around. So bringing some of those more basics into your sexual repertoire, I think, are important. All right, so what if you have a problem? What if you know, you've done the basics, you talk to your doctor, they, you're, you've got your medications exactly where they be, you know how things should be working, and something's just still not right. You know, it's important to you, you want to have the best sexual relationship with your partner, and um, you're still concerned. So if you still have a problem, you need expert help. And this little lady in the picture is Dr. Ruth, for those of you who don't recognize her. Um, and uh, a little vignette. There was actually a book that she wrote. And somehow she actually put a picture of me because my research in her little book. I can't find it, but uh, that's Dr. Ruth. And I felt like I could put her picture in this just for that. So let's get to that next um, level here. What about for men? The basics aren't working, and there are more problems that we're going to try to work on. Well, there are, the issue is looking at the type of dysfunction that's present and thinking about directive therapies. And some of the problems are poor libido, you can have erectile dysfunction, orgasmic dysfunction, premature ejaculation, and anejaculation. And I guess this is another big thing out there in the news these days. You can't uh, get far without hearing about testosterone. Testosterone is all the rage for men. And um, many men use testosterone. Well, it is the reality that many men with spinal cord injuries do have low testosterone. And um, if you have low testosterone, by increasing your testosterone, getting shots or taking other some other type of testosterone, you, testosterone works. It will increase your libido. Um, it does give people increased energy. Um, it doesn't, I don't think it's gonna change erectile function that are related to spinal cord injury, but it definitely increases libido. Um, so testosterone is something that can be used. You've gotta be careful with this. You've gotta go through your doctor. There are some issues about the side effects and increased high blood pressure in men with taking testosterone. And increased cardiac events in men. Um, you've got to think of the issue with the prostate, et cetera. But um, testosterone is an important chemical, hormone. Other things that can be used in terms of men, um, penile prostheses. Penile prostheses have really been, um, I've never advocated for them in men with spinal cord injuries, um, especially years ago. I would say how that, you know, they just cause so many problems, et cetera. But they actually have evolved over the past 30 years, and they do work better. The technology has evolved. Um, nevertheless, they're a permanent issue. You want to do it after all these other things don't work for you. But I wouldn't totally write it off. Um, years ago, they gave men penile prostheses just so they could keep condoms on. When they had a balanced bladder, 30 years ago, there were actually doctors that just put in prostheses just so the men could keep a condom on for their bladder program. We're not there anymore. But if things aren't working and you have a really good doctor and this is important to you, it is something that can be considered. And there is amazing information available on the internet. There's different types. There's inflatable, there's non-inflatable. And you can even find them on the internet. And I, this is from a, a website on the internet pre- and post-op post pictures where you, you see what happened immediately post-op, the erection that occurs, and then the one of the pictures on the bottom is someone with a, uh, a semi-rigid prosthesis that never really gets small and is just um, flaccid and erect pictures there. Now what about ejaculation and orgasm? 
Interestingly, some men with spinal cord injuries um, that are lower levels of injuries, probably injuries where they're between that belly button and the pockets, where they have some sensation there and not sensation in other parts, they actually report spontaneous ejaculation. Um, and um, so that is something that does occur after spinal cord injury. Many men have retrograde ejaculation, where instead of coming out, the ejaculation goes in. Well, what happens in terms of orgasms? Orgasms take longer to occur. A lot of times, they feel different. So they might still occur, but they feel different. You might not have ejaculation. But most men will seek a genital orgasm. And sometimes people will seek alternate places of arousal. Some men will say their ears get really aroused now. Um, or their nipples get really aroused now, or their belly button. So you've got to try everything to really see what works for you. The thing that I, I love um, is this issue of decreased spasticity after orgasm or ejaculation. Um, that is something that's very true, is that a lot of our colleagues in Europe, um, people have told me, yeah, they ejaculate every morning, and with their ejaculation, they get decreased spasticity for about eight hours. So um, it makes sense neurophysiologically, and it's, um, it would be a great, think about it as a treatment versus taking medication. <laughs> Having said this, um, this is a vibrator that um, is used, this is a Ferticare vibrator. It is used for male fertility. Um, and using vibratory stimulation does help people ejaculate. And 15 years ago, people would talk about ejaculation, and they would never talk about whether it felt good or not. And I'm happy to say now there are some people that will say, yes, it feels good if we get our men to ejaculate, actually just to ejaculate, and they learn to ejaculate this way, not just for procreation. In fact, what, um, in a, this is actually coming out of France mostly, um, and uh, in Canada, someone named Frédéric Portois, one of the scientists up there, uses um, vibratory stimulation. But then after the vibratory stimulation, if vibratory stimulation doesn't work, she will also add midodrin. And midodrin is a medication that stimulates the sympathetic nervous system. Remember that chain I talked about down the side? Well, that, what's happening when you get an orgasm or an ejaculation, which you know, kind of generally they're thinking you're having the same time, is that the sympathetic response gets up to the point where it just, it gets to the point where it gets to a threshold. And when that threshold occurs, the, these two chains kind of meet at the bottom. And when that threshold occurs, what happens is, I mean, you can kind of think of that as a, a uh, I was going to say uh, fireworks, but that's too. That's too corny, <laughs> but, but it's kind of like you're getting over a threshold and you're just having a general increase in neurologic impulses. So the sympathetics are going and then they're stimulating the, the automatic, ner the somatic nervous system or the voluntary nervous system, which is why people that are able-bodied will have involuntary movements of their muscles and people with spinal cord injuries will have increased spasticity. And then once that occurs, then the parasympathetic takes over. So by augmenting the sympathetic, we're actually improving people's sexual responses. So midodrine has been tried in men, along with the vibratory stimulation. For women, we also have a number of areas. One is hypoactive sexual desire, arousal problems, orgasm problems, and pain disorder. Um, I want to bring up here mindfulness, because mindfulness, um, as I think about it, it's very similar to the issue of sensate focus, which is what Masters and Johnson talked about, really just trying to focus on a certain area. And so with mindfulness, when you're being mindful, one of the things is to focus on your breathing. Just focus on your breathing and not think any, about anything else. And certainly for women, um, maybe for men too, I'm not a man, so I can't say, but with the issue of mindfulness, you're getting away from that, those distractions that are keeping people from being into their sexual function. They're not thinking about, so it's been used in gynecologic cancer. So instead of thinking about cancer and all the problems associated with cancer, just trying to think about the issues of 
what's feeling good. And let's just think about that feeling and keep thinking about it and get lost in it. And so mindfulness has worked. And mindfulness is certainly a basic area for women with arousal problems to work on, and also probably men. Um, testosterone is also good for women. Now, it's not approved in the United States. It has been approved in Europe um, for treating hypoactive sexual disorder, desire disorder due to sexual, uh, due to surgical menopause, meaning women that have their ovaries taken out. So basically, it's like getting castrated. When you get your ovaries out, you lose your testosterone. And for women that have low testosterone, testosterone works. It's been shown that it works. Um, there are a lot of women in the United States that take testosterone. You just have to go to a compounding pharmacy, and you can get testosterone free me. And there are many women that take it off-label and will swear by it. Testosterone has not been approved by the FDA in the United States. So for anybody listening to this, I'm not advocating one way or another. I'm just telling people what's, what is out there. But it has also been used and has been shown to be very um, beneficial for some people. So what are some of the other therapies we've looked at for women? Um, well, I've looked at a number of therapies in the laboratory and at home. I was a, a lead investigator on an international multi-center study looking at sildenafil in women with spinal cord injuries. Um, unfortunately, it was not shown to work, but if you kind of looked at how the study had to be devised because of the FDA's rules, um, there was almost no way it could work because what they were looking for the drug to do was increase women's successful sexual encounters. Now, I'm not sure what a successful sexual encounter is if you're a woman. It's kind of like, okay, if you have sex, it's a successful encounter. They weren't looking at women's pleasure. They were looking at, are they having sex? And so, so Delphi was not gonna make them have more sex. That was not really it. So the women that were in the control got better, and the women on Sildenafil got better, and um, there, it wasn't shown to do anything. Having said that, for some women it does help. I've had women tell me when they've taken it off label that it's been beneficial for them. Certainly it helps men with spinal cord injuries with certain types. It would probably similarly help women with certain types, so it's something that could be considered on an off label basis for people. Um, different types of increasing arousal versus um, Feedback um, and local stimulation have also been tried. And I did a study also in women using the same Ferticare vibrators you can see here. But what we did was we took the tip off of it and put a soft um, tip that comes from a vibrator called an air oscillator. And so we used that for women. We also used the Eros device, which is FTA approved to treat orgasm and dysfunction. And both of these actually have women um, have a higher rate of having orgasm after. Midodrine has also been used in women with spinal cord injuries to improve their ability to have um, arousal and orgasm. And it's something that um, bears further discussion and review when people, it is something people could um, consider. Again, this is off label. What else is out there? There is a new drug that just last week went back to the FDA in the U.S. for its third pass to be approved to treat female sexual arousal disorder. Um, it is a multifactorial serotonin um, agonist antagonist and um, we'll see what happens this time. They've had two strikes and they're going for their third go round with the FDA to see if it gets approved for women and if it does, I'm sure it'll be a big thing out there because it'll be approved not just for spinal cord injury but for women in general. Um, also, there's the issue of women that have pain with sexual function and there is a medication out there now that's been out in the U.S. for a year called Ospemethine and basically this is for treating pain associated with or skin turgor, um, postmenopausal women that have uh, poor tissue in the genital area. So if they're having sex, the, the skin is just not as soft and doesn't get as engorged and beefy as it used to. It's kind of dry and, and not just dry, but just the texture of the uh, skin is, is just not there anymore. And, and aspemaphine does make vaginal tissue thicker, less fragile, so there's a decrease in pain in women that take it. So having said this, I'm going back here. 
and I've said all the serious stuff and that sort of thing. And hopefully I've everybody's got one little area that they've learned about or thought something uh, about. And I want you to all realize though that sex is sex. It's meant to be fun. We have to take it and just laugh at ourselves sometimes. Because you know, we all have bad days and we all have bad nights. It doesn't matter who you are or how old you are, if you're, you know, 18 or if you're 80. You have to kind of be relaxed. And definitely a little humor is a good idea. So I'm sort of ending this ending my note on a couple little cute slides here. I take it you haven't had sex for a while and you can see the sperm that you have are now grown up from tadpoles into full fledged toads. And then there's this one, and um, this is from someone in Britain. And the guy on top saying, I got long blonde hair up to my big breasts, and my red mouth is juicy. And the little guy in the bottom says, oh, and of course, he's got a beard. And the little guy in the bottom says, oh, Rhea, my muscle body is shaking of desire. I want you now. <laughs> so you can't um, believe everything you hear. And you have to realize that sometimes you just got to take it all a step by step and enjoy the process. So having said that, um, thank you all. And I'm certainly happy to have any questions. And remember, sex is supposed to be fun. So we'll see if we have um, people with microphones that can take questions. And we'll also take questions from the board of the webcasters, too. So um, if you have any questions, we'll have I know it's like the port of, port of care is several hundred dollars uh, and so are a lot of the other devices from what I've heard and it's like I don't want to shell out that kind of money for something that I don't know if it's even going to work so but I have never been able to find any place that has any kind of um, try before you buy as it were uh, and is that something that there's going to be any kind of way to you know find out if something works before you have to uh, well, I think that's a, a really good question. I think the issue of Furticares is that, you know, there's no magic in a Furticare. Just trying, a, like, the magic wand that was shown is something you can try, too. You don't have to go out and invest the 800 bucks in that or that sort of thing. But you do have a, um, a good point there, and that's one of the reasons to get involved and, and kind of try some things out. Um, try before you buy. Certainly if there was a Furticare and you put a condom over it, one person could try it and then another person could try it. But I don't think, you know, the purpose of the Furticare is really not for just sex. The purpose of the Furticare really was made for fertility purposes. So I would not encourage someone to go out and buy a Furticare to, to have an orgasm or that sort of thing. I would say try something more basic. I would say just try a different type of vibrator and see what works with something like that first. That's what I would suggest. And I, and I do need to say here that if people have a high level of spinal cord injury above T6, there definitely is a possibility for dysreflexia. And I do not mean to um, dismiss that. That is something you need to think about. Um, generally, people know if their blood pressure is going up. They may have a headache. If that does happen, you need to stop what you're doing. And you need to obviously be prepared for that. Having said that, the definition of dysreflexia medically is that your blood pressure goes up 20 points and I was in the room when this definition was developed and I kind of think of it now and I'm like this doesn't necessarily make sense to me because all of our blood pressure goes up 20 points when we have orgasms so just because your blood pressure is going up 20 points doesn't mean it's bad and if your baseline blood pressure is like 100 and it goes up to 120 by definition people could say you're dysreflexic but you really you know, it's part of having an orgasm. Your blood pressure goes up when you have an orgasm. It's just the way it is, everybody. You're, there's, it's just, just the way life is. So um, you have to be careful for that, but um, just be cognizant. Yes? Yeah. Okay. Has your research shown any difference in the likelihood of orgasm between people with spinal cord injury where they have a traumatic injury and it's just in one place versus people who have an ischemic injury that is a result of loss of uh, blood to the nerves and they've got a more diffuse 
problem. So with people having ischemic injuries, I did not study those people in the laboratory, but in particular when people have an ischemic injury, it's generally at the level of T8 um, or the thoracic area and it goes down the spinal cord. And in that case, if it does an impact on the lowest nerves where there is a decrease in reflexes and a decrease in um, function in that area from that, then it would impact differently. Than, than a traumatic spinal cord injury would. And that's a, but that's the kind of thing where you actually would need to kind of talk to the person in detail about it. Those would be, if my injury was something like that, I'd be trying to focus on some of the more psychologic um, treatments or the psychogenic areas. And I'd really need to see whether, what kind of sensation the person had remaining in their general area to kind of give you more details about. Having said that, I know somebody had, um, people did have a question about the sexuality clinic that we're going to be starting here. What we're going to be starting is a um, spinal cord education um, sexuality clinic for people first at, at Spalding that are inpatients. And I actually don't live up here. I live in Alabama, and I don't really have any uh, desire to move to the cold. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to be doing this via telemedicine to Spalding um, starting in the next few months is the plan. And our goal is to ultimately make it so it can be not just to inpatients at Spalding, but to people all over. And I think that in terms of sexuality, this is an area where because spinal cord injury um, exams are so standard because we have the international standards exam, as long as you've got a good examination from your doctor and, and a good doctor that has a really detail, detailed um, report on you, it's going to be possible to do some counseling via telemedicine. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. We have a question on the webcast. I'm sorry, on the, um, I'm sorry, on the chat. Uh, and the question is, the psychophysiological aspects of female sexuality has not been explored enough. Dr. Sibsky, could you speak a little on that? Well, I guess I would say that the psychophysiologic aspects of female sexuality have probably been explored in spinal cord injury more than most other areas. Um, again, I, I mean, if you looked at the issue of diabetes and that sort of thing and how many laboratory-based studies there are, there are not that many that are happening, and yet there's a lot more work in women with spinal cord injuries, which is kind of what, what I have done the laboratory-based work. That's what psychophysiologic means to the people in the room. So um, it's definitely an area where you could do more work. You can, there's definitely room for future research in this area, but I do think we have a good baseline. And I think the other thing, though, I guess as I would, I would say is that when it comes to actually demonstrating that techniques work, um, from the standpoint of doing clinical trials, at least in the United States, the FDA does not really care about laboratory-based research. They care about what works and what doesn't work for people. And so um, there have been a number of therapies that looked in the laboratory like they worked. Like I did a study in the laboratory with Viagra and women, and it did show that it improved function when women with spinal cord injuries in the laboratory. But then when we got it out into the clinical trial where people were taking it full and saying it works or it doesn't work, we didn't get the results that were, need, that were necessary to have it approved for that reason. So um, I would say I guess there's a balance. Like there's definitely room for more psychophysiologic studies in women, um, not just with spinal cord injury, but other disorders too. And, uh, but also for clinical trials too. Thank you, Marka, for an outstanding lecture. Um, thank you all for, for coming tonight. I, I'd like to remind everybody to please fill out their surveys and give them to us, and to please have your parking validated um, when you leave in the lobby. Um, and so, thank, thank you for Thanks. Everyone have a good night.